Good morning. Welcome to Magnify. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. Whether you're here in the room, joining us online, welcome. Would you please stand? We're going to begin this morning by singing to the God who gives good gifts, our Heavenly Father. Before we do so, say hello to somebody near you. If you're online, say hello in the chat. failing. We can know this for certain so much that we can put all of our faith and trust in him and not an abstract sort of heady sort of just faith and trust but one in which our whole lives are reborn so that every part of us is unrecognizable. We're going to learn about from James today that it's faith with works is that whole real deal. It's only because of his promises. Please sing with us as you feel able. 
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come. Your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. No, God of Abraham, the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Yeah, history can prove there's nothing you can do. Your faithful act. The storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart know when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness.
leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the Grab your seat. My name is Andrew, and I'm part of the team here at Magnify, and we are so glad that you are with us this morning, whether you're in this room or online. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. You see, when we come together on Sunday mornings, we get to come together and connect with each other. We get to see each other before the service, between services. We get to learn about what's going on in each other's lives. Like someone came up to me and said, Andrew, how was your week, and what's it like having a preteen? And I was like, preteen, that's all you need to say right there. Another person was talking to me, is like, it was such a good week, and we felt like we were finally making a step around the corner. We, we felt like we are growing towards health. And I just love those opportunities to connect with each other, to pursue each other, to love each other with what we're going through, because we're all going through a lot, and we get to gather together to connect online and talk to each other online or here in person. Another reason that we gather every week is to learn from God's word, and today Trevor's bringing the word to us from James, and I am excited to sit under the word and learn what God has been doing in Trevor's life as he presents it to us. And then one of the last things we get to do is we get to worship God through music. It's just such a great morning to worship him. And another way that we get to worship God through music is next Sunday night is our praise service, and that starts at 6 p.m., and we get to come together and sing our faces off and worshiping God. I can't wait to do that next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We'd love for you to join us. It's also going to be online streaming. So we'd love for you to be a part of this any way that you can. 
You know, one thing about how we worship God with our whole lives is revealed through how we give to him. Thank you for being people who worship God and in response to worshiping him, out of gratitude, give to him through this place. Thank you for faithfully giving so that we continue the mission of his work in our communities. Will you pray with me? Father, we come before you so grateful for who you are. You're our God, our creator, and you made us in your image, and you gave us free will. You could have made us robots, but you didn't. But in that free will, we chose our own way. We rejected you and your plan. Every day we do this. Every day we hurt others, we hurt ourselves, we hurt you, and we confess this to you. We do this out of our pride, our arrogance, our selfishness, so many different reasons. And here you are, you created us, and you said, I love you so much, I'm going to send my only son to die on the cross and to be raised again so that we could have relationship with you forever. Thank you for this gift of grace. We need it. In our community today, we have so many people hurting, emotionally, physically. We ask that you be with each of us. Heal our hurts. Mend us. Restore us. Some of these hurts are relational. Some of these hurts are mental. Some of these hurts are physical. We believe that you are with us in the midst of all of these. Give us the courage and the strength to trust you. Thank you that even when we doubt you, you are near us. You don't distance yourself from us. Thank you. We think about the work that you are doing to further your kingdom in our communities and also around the world. And we think of Tim and Rebecca Hawkins and the work that they are doing in Germany. Thank you for the men's conference retreat that just happened. Thank you for the opportunity they had to equip and empower leaders to share your gospel. Thank you for the women's retreat that's coming up here in October. We ask that you continue to be with Rebecca as she puts all the pieces together as she prepares for this time. Prepare the hearts of the women who are coming. And thank you that right now they're in the States and they're learning and being developed. And the next week they're going to be up here with us. Thank you for the opportunities that they have to learn, to be encouraged, and to encourage us. Lastly, we just ask that you humble our hearts, give us an open mind to receive your word. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome once again to Magnify. My name is Trevor, and I am one of the pastors here and part of this team. And recently, I've gone through a little bit of a role change here at church. For the last 10 plus years, I've been working with our middle school team, and I've absolutely loved doing that. And most recently, now I'm working with our high school team. And that's been a great, fun transition. And many of you have come up to me and asked, what has that transition been like? And I appreciate your kindness engaging with me and all these different things that I've been working through. And I'd love to give you guys just a brief little window into what my very first time with high school was like. So if you're unfamiliar with how we gather with our students, on Sunday nights from 5.30 to 7, we meet with our high schoolers over in the student center. It's over there where we get to have a time of community, we get to play some games, worship, and do some teaching together. And it's a great time, and as I was thinking through that, as it being my first nightlife, I was trying to think of what can I do to kind of bring a little bit of what middle school was into high school. And so I was trying to think of some of the culture pieces that we have in middle school, and one of the things that stood out to me is if I have to get the attention of our middle schoolers, is I have this call and response phrase. It's something I took from a camp I used to work at. I say this silly phrase where I just yell out to them, I say, say something, and they all respond back. I bet you won't. 
And that's our culture. <laughs> We've just done that for a long time. And it's a way I can get their attention. They, for some reason, buy into it. And it's a fun thing that we get to do together. And so I was trying to think, could I do something like that in high school? But for high schoolers, you know, the silliness only goes so far. <laughs> you have to find something that they want to say. And so I was racking my brain. I opened up my notes app, and I was just trying to list off all these different things I could come up with of things that maybe they would want to say to participate in this. And eventually I landed on something. I was like, oh, this is a home run. Not only do they want to say this, but it also kind of pokes loving fun at our other high school pastor, Stu Quackenbush. And I'm like, this is perfect. And so we go into our first night life, and I'm hanging out with some of the students. We're getting ready to do our announcements, which is when Stu was going to go up onto the stage. But before he does that, he has to make his way into the office, so he steps out of the room for a moment. And while he steps up, I kind of gather all the students in. I'm like, all right, here's what we're going to do. And I explain this inside joke that Stu is out of. I say, all right, when Stu comes up on stage, I'm going to say this. And then you're going to respond with this. And they're like, all right, all right, we're in. And so Stu comes back into the room. He steps up onto the stage. And right before he gives his announcements, I'm over in the background. And I yell out to all the students, hear ye, hear ye. They roar back to me, long live the king. <laughs> and Stu comes up jaw a little open, and says, never say that again, <laughs> which is perfect. We're going to do it every single week now. I love it. It's going to be a continual thing until eternity, and so I love that. That is just a small window into my transition lately, so thank you for just your kindness and just caring for me and all of that. I love that I get to now work with our high schoolers, but I also love having time up here and doing some teaching. And so this morning, we're going to continue in our series of insignificant moments. And so if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to open up to James chapter 2, starting at verse 14, and we're going to go through 26. Please follow along as I read. It starts, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them any need for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith, faith was active along with works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. What James is communicating in this section is the idea of putting our faith in action. He goes through this entire message when he's really trying to communicate to us that our faith, apart from works, is dead. And this can be a pretty challenging passage for us, and it has been for many people for many years. Most famously, we can look to Martin Luther, who really wrestled with this idea because he really felt as it went against what Paul was saying, that we are saved by faith and faith alone. Even to the point where he's like, I don't even think this book of the Bible should be in the Bible. Or if anything, maybe push it to the very end, after Revelation, just kind of tuck it into the back there. He was really wrestling with this idea of keeping this in because it felt like it was too much opposing what the Apostle Paul was saying. But I really think that James had a very specific audience that he was trying to target when he was writing this. And here's what I think that audience was. 
This is a picture of a bus that my wife and I used to own. And we bought this bus soon after we got married. And what I mean by that is soon after we got married, I bought my wife a bus. <laughs> and lovingly, she let me keep it. And when we, over time, turned this bus into this fun little adventure mobile, we would take trips on weekends and go uh, these different locations. But this one specific trip always stands out to me because it was more of our big, long trip out west. And so as we were building out the bus, we grabbed a couple friends and we headed out west together. And I had this destination in mind of where I wanted to really land. And that was specifically Zion National Park. And that's where this picture is taken. And I had this idea of, man, I really want to go here. I want to experience these things. But not only did I want to get to the destination, I really had a way, a method of how I wanted to get out there. Over the years of driving this bus, I realized it's not the most comfortable thing to drive. And one thing that really frustrated me is that I didn't have cruise control. And it was something where I was like always having to reach for the pedals that were just too far away, driving through the night of, you know, Iowa or Kansas. We're trying to make our way out to Colorado. These are just long hours. I would want nothing more than just be able to push a button, put this thing on cruise control, and just let it go. If nothing else, I'd want to turn it into a Tesla, and it'd drive me out there itself. But that wasn't the case. And I think James, when he's thinking about the audience he's going to, he's thinking about people who say a prayer and then put their faith on cruise control. These are people who have a destination in mind. They would love to get to heaven with God, but the way they go about it, the way they get there, is they'd love to just put their faith on cruise control and not really have to participate in any of this. And that's, I think, the audience James is pushing back against in this text. Because the message that faith without works is dead seems to go against this idea that we are saved by faith and faith alone. This morning, I want us to consider how both of these statements are true and encourage us that the idea of faith and works move us towards an idea of daily repentance, gratitude, and having confidence that we are saved and justified by faith to do good works. So with that in mind, let's go back into the text at verse 14 and read this together and understand this going forward. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? James is starting out with this rhetorical question of saying, what good is it, my brothers? Another way I like to view this is, what does it profit? And I like that word profit because I feel like it gives me a different mental image than what good is it. What does it profit? What does it produce? What benefit does it give me if I'm going to be someone who says he has faith but does not have works? James seems to, at face value at least, say that we are not saved by faith and faith alone. In fact, in verse 24 of this passage, he says that we are justified by works and not by faith and faith alone. You've probably heard that phrase, they came out swinging. I feel like it's what James is doing a little bit in this passage. He's not pulling any of his punches. He's really trying to make this stand and have us understand this pretty clearly. And so to help us understand it, he gives us this hypothetical situation of someone who is in physical need but has only offered empty words as the remedy. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed, and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So he paints us this picture. If I was going to recreate this story today, here's how I would tell it. Say it's in the middle of the week, it's lunchtime, and I make my way down to Chick-fil-A on 28th Street. I get in line and I order my number one no pickle add cheese with extra Chick-fil-A sauce. If you're someone who takes notes in these sermons, that's, that is my exact order. Feel free to drop it off anytime. <laughs> and if I am walking out of this Chick-fil-A with my food and Dr. Pepper in hand, and I see one of my students sitting outside this Chick-fil-A, and I can visibly see that they are underfed, they're cold, they are agitated and their clothes are all ripped and torn and not in like a cool hip way. And if all I did 
was look at them and say, go in peace, and then walked away. Am I helping them at all? No, of course not. And that's what James is really trying to draw out throughout this rhetorical question and this hypothetical situation by saying, faith unapplied is unprofitable. Faith unapplied is unprofitable. If we are not living out this life that Christ is calling us to, if we are not being the hands and feet of Christ, the salt and light, we are not living out and building out this kingdom in a profitable way. And so he asks that question, well, what good is it? Answer, it's not good. Which lands us in verse 17 that says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And not just outwardly dead. It is inwardly dead. It is lifeless and useless. But someone who looks at this phrase, faith unapplied is unprofitable, they can make the argument, but Trav, doesn't Paul say that we are saved by faith and faith alone? And they'd have a pretty solid point. There's multiple verses that point us to this. Two that come to my mind quickly are in Romans 3.28, where it says, For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So who is right? Is James right? Is Paul right? Are they fighting about this? Are they trying to get equal ground on all this tension? No. James and Paul are not at odds with each other. In fact, they are standing back to back fighting two separate enemies. We have Paul on this side who is saying, we are, whenever he's talking about faith and works, that we are saved by faith and faith alone. That grace is so good, it is so encompassing, it is allowing us to experience the love of God by nothing of our own doing. We cannot add to grace. That's what he is fighting against. And he's fighting for something as well. He's fighting for the greatness of grace. That this is so good that if we try to add to it, we will make it worse. This is what Paul's argument is over here. But James is now saying, when he is talking about faith and works, is that yes, we are saved by faith, but we cannot have a faith that is then set on cruise control. He's fighting against that narrative. And just like how Paul is fighting for something as well, James is fighting for something. He's saying that these good works are an invitation from God to help give us confidence that we truly have a transformed heart. To give us a little bit more understanding of how these things are separate, We can also see that Paul, when he's talking to his audience, is often talking to people who have yet to come to know the Lord. These are pre-converted people. He is saying that you can't earn your spot to the point when you are saved. Where James is talking as he opens this letter, dear brothers and sisters, these are people who are already saved. And if you are already saved, you are now being called into something. You are not just saved from something, but to something a partnership, a life of being able to pour out and to care for others out of a gratitude of a transformed heart. These two things cannot and should not be separated. And when they are, it allows us to reflect on what are we grateful for and what the Lord has done in our own life. The summer going into my senior year of college, I had the opportunity to work out at a Christian camp being a high ropes instructor. And I really enjoyed this uh, job for many reasons, but one thing I loved doing is seeing these students overcome their fears. They'd be harnessed in, they'd have these ropes that they were attached to, and there is often this one element where they were on this very high platform. And what they had to do was repel off of this platform, trusting this rope to hold them. And you could see them as they were just up there. They were intimidated. They were scared. And for them to take that step of faith was just so incredible to witness and encourage and then to celebrate. And yes, I loved seeing those moments, but I also loved how practical that element is to our faith, that they could actually see their faith being put into action. 
Many of them, as we were having these conversations, would have that hesitation where then they would need to be talked into this understanding of, okay, we can do this together. Because they would see camper after camper, friend after friend, go up there, take that step off of that platform, and they were completely safe. And yet when they were up there by themselves, something different would happen. And there's that scaredness that would come into them. And we could have as much knowledge and conversation about that where I'd say, all right, do you believe that this rope is going to hold you? They'd say, yes. Did you see your friend go off and are they safe? Yes. Great. Are you going to jump? No. (laughs) Even though they have faith in this rope, they have belief that this rope is going to save them, there is something different about having faith in a rope and actually having a fullness of faith that allows you to actually take that step. And so to illustrate that further for us this morning, Will, would you mind joining us on stage this morning? Trev, I would be delighted. (laughs) Ah, nice of you to join us, Will. Thank you. I'm going to move this table just a little bit. Ah, Will. Glad you could be here. Thank you. I'm excited (laughs) and also scared. I think I felt better up there. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Will, would you mind just sharing with us, uh, as you were up there and maybe kind of coming down, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I I like how you've been talking about the fact that obedience compels us to action. Hmm. And I see now both individually and then also hopefully communally uh, that there's a tangible difference between saying that I believe something and taking an action step that stakes my health and safety on that belief. (laughs) Yes. So church has good insurance. All right, great. We're alive. Oh, thank goodness. Guys, round of applause for Will. He did fantastic. That was so great. Yes, as we can see from Will and his demonstration from this, he was putting his full faith into action by having his way and descending with that rope. And that is the kind of faith that God and James is talking us about. We can have all the mental assent. We can have all the knowledge and say, oh yeah, I believe in God. I believe that he saved me. But are you willing to put that into action? If my younger self was out here in this audience right now, I think a couple things I'd be thinking about, I'd be going back to the core verse that I knew when I was younger is that John 3.16. I'd be saying, well, Trev, doesn't, doesn't John 3.16 say that Whoever believes in him is saved. I think I'd be looking for some sort of assurance that the prayer I prayed when I was younger in Iwana, was that prayer enough? Is my faith enough? And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're wondering, am I truly saved? And I don't mean to be one up here trying to question your faith, but if that's something you might be feeling, I'm encouraged if the Spirit is at work in our hearts to allow us to ask these tough questions. And maybe you're not feeling that for yourself this morning. Maybe you're feeling that for a loved one. Or maybe you're feeling that for a spouse, a family member, a friend, for one of your kids, for one of your grandkids. And as a newer parent, my heart goes out to you. I would want nothing more than for my young son and my soon-to-be daughter to grow up and to confess with their mouth that they are sinners, that they believe that Christ died for their sin, and that he conquered the grave. And that's why I believe that this portion of Scripture is so important for us, because it clearly shows what faith is and what faith is not. James now continues, and he talks about what it means to have belief in something, but maybe not have evidence of that belief. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Even the demons believe and shudder. These are powerful words. 
And I believe James is going for a certain amount of shock value as he's saying this, because essentially what he's equating is people's belief or their mental knowledge of God, and he's equating that to that of demons. And that's mind-blowing to me. But at the same time, I fully believe that there is not a demon in the universe that's an atheist. In fact, at one point, every single demon was in the throne room of God worshiping him. They have no trouble knowing that there is a God who is incredibly powerful. But it does them no good. Another person who I think is going for a little bit of a shock value statement is the author and theologian Kent Hughes. He was doing a study on the book of James, and he has this quote. Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. If we are lacking good works born out of the gratitude of Christ, we may be in the clutches of Satan, the necromancer of lost souls. Now that last phrase there, the necromancer of lost souls, that really stood out to me this past week, and I was trying to understand it more. It's not a word I, I use or hear all that often, and for some reason my mind goes to a place of necromancer, there's a, a darkness, there's a mysticism about it, and so I was looking up definitions of what this could really mean and how it applies to this message, and one of the working definitions is this idea of someone who can animate the dead. And so if we think of that and we think of this as Satan being a necromancer of lost souls, Satan is someone who loves to give us a substitute for the real. He wants to offer us a false version of life, a substitute for life, an animation. And by doing that, trying to distract us and keep our souls lost. Even the demons believe and shudder. What James is pointing us to is that there is a belief in God which is not real faith. And he loves us enough to share this in a way that could make us shudder. Real faith involves the heart. Real faith is what allows us to confess with our mouth that Christ is Lord and believe that God is powerful enough to raise his son from the grave. And so if you believe that in your heart, that you are justified by faith to do good works. To understand this more, he gives us two case studies, two characters are people who do have true and real faith. Characters of Abraham and Rahab. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. And you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So here we have these two characters. We're going to talk about Rahab in a moment, but let's just talk about these two together for a little bit. We have a man and we have a woman. A patriarch and a prostitute. A Jew and a Gentile. A friend of God and someone who is in the enemy camp of God. These two people cannot be more different than each other. And they're not being compared and contrasted to say one is better than the other in any sense. They're being compared because of their differences and yet both of them are heralded as heroes of the faith. If we look more at the Abraham story, what is being talked about here is this idea that in Genesis 22, Abraham had to sacrifice his son. And to give some background on this story, which is still the most perplexing and complicated story for me to read in the whole Old Testament, is we have our character Abraham. And he's been wanting a son for a long, long time. And after many years of waiting and being faithful to the Lord, God grants him this. And he gets this son. And it's this wonderful celebration. And then years later, he is being asked to sacrifice his son back to God. And as I'm wrestling with the story this past week in preparation for this, I'm trying to make sense of it. And 
I'm going through many different authors and books that are talking about this story, trying to understand it more myself. And I found one author who was trying to really be in the shoes of Abraham. What was he feeling? What was that like? What is this going through? And I want to read for you just what his version of this might look like. If we look between the lines of this story, we can see the emotional journey of Abraham and the true faith it took to believe the words of God. Abraham instructs his companions to stay while him and his son go worship the Lord. You can picture the sobbing, the kisses, the tears, the terrible blade in the father's trembling hand, the nausea, the darkness, the imminent convulsions of his one and only son. All of this shows only a fraction of Abraham's emotions. But then the rescuing call of heaven bursts forth. Abraham, Abraham. And Isaac was saved. Abraham's faith was attributed to him as righteousness. And these are not just isolated events to this one story. In Hebrews 11, when it talks about Abraham, it says that there are many points when he had and showed this faith. In verse 8, it says that he started out in faith. So when God first called him. Verse 9, it says that he sojourned in faith. And verse 17, which references this story, that he sacrificed in faith. This is a beautiful example of how faith and works come together in tandem to show a transformed heart of what God has accomplished on that cross. The story of Abraham is an incredible foreshadowing of how God, our perfect father, provided Christ, referred to in John 1 as the Lamb of God, as our substitute. We deserved to die. Our sin required the blade of justice to be raised against us. But Jesus Christ, for the joy sent before him, endured the cross, and we can receive grace and salvation through his death and resurrection. The good deeds James is talking about here is not a means of salvation, but a result of what Christ is coming into your life and declaring you righteous for what he accomplished on the cross. It is out of gratitude that we can offer good works back to him. Not in a way that seals our salvation, but as a proper outflowing of a heart that has been transformed and is no longer dead in sin, but has been made alive and by grace can now work to love God and others. This is James's calling on our life. To do good works through the transformed heart that can rest in the confidence that you are justified by He continues as he shares about the story of Rahab. And in the same way, was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. I love that James includes Rahab in the story. Not only do I love the story and the character of Rahab, but I also love that a lot of people could see that Abraham, well, of course he gets his faith justified because of his righteousness. He's a patriarch. He's done all these things. He's the father of our faith. All of these things can make a, a good argument of why he gets this. And then he throws in the character of Rahab. This is someone who did not have a direct conversation with God. All she had were these spies who came before her. And because of the assurance that they had in the one true God, she sees that what they have is different. And she wants that as well. And so she puts that faith that she sees and puts it into action. Because of that, righteousness was then given to her. And I don't want to be confusing that it was only because of the actions of Abraham and Rahab that faith was given to them. Because Scripture makes two things very clear. The first is that salvation is by faith alone. We see this over and over in the couple verses that Paul writes that declares this. It's first in Galatians 3.6. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Romans 4.5 says, And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as 
as righteousness. And again, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So then how can James argue that works are required? And I would say he wouldn't argue in that way. James would say that we are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith which is alone. The second thing that's made very clear is that salvation is by faith which is not alone. And that is what James is trying to hit over and over and over again in this passage. In verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Verse 18, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James understands that the faith that Abraham had in Genesis 15 before he sacrificed his son is true faith. And this is what the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 is all about, putting faith and works together. And you could even say that the hall of faith, we could even rename it the hall of works or the hall of faith that works. Because it says that by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Moses led God's people. And by faith, Rahab hid the spies. These things cannot and should not be separated. As I begin to close our time together, I want to point us to these four categories for us to consider and think through. These four things can help us understand and have assurance that we are saved and have a transformed heart. The first thing we need to look at is our sin. If we get this wrong, we get the rest of these three wrong as well. We first have to acknowledge and see that we are the sinner that we are people who are broken, that have separated ourselves between us and God. And if we see and view this properly, that can then move us to this idea that we are in need of the cross, that we need Christ in our lives, that we need what he accomplished on that cross to make up for the fact that we are a sinful, broken people. And if we view the cross correctly, we will then live a life out of gratitude for the cross. And when you live a life out of gratitude, you will then produce fruit. If we view our sin properly, which moves us towards the cross, which allows us to have a grateful heart for what he accomplished on that cross, which then we can live a life that produces good fruit. But another way we can look at this is instead of starting at the top, is if we start at the bottom. If we ask this, ourselves the question, do you see fruit in your life? And if the answer is no, or if someone is coming to you saying, I don't see fruit in your life, there's a good chance that you do not see fruit in your life because you are not grateful and living life out of gratitude. And what aren't you grateful for? You're not grateful for the cross and what it accomplished. And you're not grateful for the cross and what it accomplished because you do not have a proper view of your sin. And so whether you start with your sin and understanding that right or asking yourselves the question, do I see fruit? We have to make sure we see these in order and view them properly. Doing this allows us to have assurance that we are saved through a transformed heart that God has placed and given to us. I want to close our time with allowing us to respond with communion. And so before we go to communion, I'm going to put our next steps up on the screen. Because as we have a time of silence and reflection, I want us to consider these next steps as a part of that time. So our next steps for this week are to Reflect on the relationship between sin, cross, gratitude, and fruit. Ask God to help you better understand their impact on your faith. And next is to think of one person this week that you can encourage about the fruit you see in their life. And so in a moment, you can either close your eyes or bow your head and just have a time of silence and reflection and remembrance, not only of what these are, but also a remembrance that it was Christ's body that was broken for us and also that his blood was shed on our behalf. And so take some time right now 
reflect on these things, and I'll conclude our time by reading our passage. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please stand as we read our closing scripture together. Please read this with me in unison. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Please remain standing as we respond and worship together. Let's look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on. That cursed tree His body bound And drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still Then on the 
for being with us this morning. If you are in need of prayer, there are people who will be down here ready to pray with you. If you are in need of someone to rejoice with you for the work that the Lord is doing in your life, please come forward for that also. Go in peace. Have a great day.